<laughs> okay. okay, hi everyone. Sorry to disrupt your conversations. I am I'm Elise and I really uh, welcome you uh, for this event. This is our very first physical in person event organized by Vertex Ventures Southeast Asia. And then um, the series is called um, Hard Questions. And today I'm really honored to invite Jeffrey Chong. Uh, founding CEO of PaxNet and if you have been following you know, the unicorn and all that you will know that last year they raised um, a round that actually made them a unicorn status right? Yeah. so I'm going to start this whole thing okay? and I invite you to have a seat and then if you haven't gotten any food um, please get it later <laughs> so no going to getting food now um, yeah, and, and I would need your cooperation by, uh, you know, keeping the chat, uh, the chatting volume to the minimum so that all of us can hear the, the exchange. Yeah, and uh, before this, you know, uh, quite a few of you have submitted your questions to me, so I will be weaving it into the whole conversation. Yeah, but um, at the end, if we have more questions, we have more time, I will invite you to ask the question um, in person, okay? Okay, so without further ado, um, I'm just going to do an introduction of Vertex Venture and also Jeffrey. Yeah, then we'll be jumping into the question proper. Yeah. Um, Jeffrey, you have a Okay, okay, okay. Maybe uh, first, uh, can I have a show of hand who are entrepreneurs? I think, I think this is, should be the most in the room. And then uh, investors, cool, okay, um, ecosystem partners, tech, okay, nice, nice, it's a really good mix. Okay, so, um, so firstly I was saying that this is our very first um, physical event organized by uh, Vertex Ventures Southeast Asia. So for most of you, if you are not aware of Vertex Ventures, we are early stage fund. Uh, we are also a network of six funds uh, around the world. We operate, um, for this fund, we operate in Southeast Asia and India. And then we are also present in Israel, China, US. We also have 200 funds that are focused in growth stage, which is Series C and above. And then another one is healthcare focused. So for Southeast Asia and India, we are focused in early stage. So that can be pre-Series A, Series A and A. So besides PetSnet, we also have other unicorns in the portfolio, such as Miam, uh, in India that is uh, First Cry, as well as Vicious. Yeah. So if any of you are fundraising, you know, uh, we, we are sector and non state, and, uh, but, but obviously some of our portfolio comes from uh, FinTech, SaaS, Consumer, Health Tech, Sustainability, you know, including IT Tech. Yeah. So do talk to us. So I have a few colleagues over here. So we have Wayne. And then we have Chani, yeah. So feel free to check, um, talk to them if you were to uh, be fundraising, okay? Yeah. So let me introduce now um, Jeffrey. So as you know, Jeffrey, um, he's with PestNet. And PestNet, someone was asking me this question. It actually means short for patents in a snap. So PestNet, right? They provide data and analytics on intellectual property to more than 10,000 customers including Spotify, Technology, and Xiaomi Corp. They employ more than 700 people in Singapore, London, Toronto. The customers include businesses, universities, startups, and research organizations. Since the inception in 2007, PetsNet has achieved um, phenomenal success as evident by its move to the unicorn status last year after the first round of funding pushes valuation to over 1 billion with uh, SoftBank Vision Fund 2, Tencent Investment among those who were backing them. Um, so there, there are many others, but obviously we also continue to back them. So we led PetSnap in uh, 2014 Series A, and then later on in D+, Plus, and finally in uh, Series E round, which is uh, 300 million. Yeah. So we have grown a lot with um, Jeffrey uh, over the years, and it's really, you know, really uh, phenomenal, it's really heartwarming to see how he has grown, how his company has grown. Yeah, so it's very exciting to partner with our um, entrepreneurs on the journey and this is what we do. We, 
we put a lot of um, emphasis not just on you know funding but also on helping the companies to grow open doors to customers next round investors um, even key hires as well yeah okay so i think <laughs> i have talked a lot and i'm sure you guys are waiting to hear from jeffrey so today, as you know, the, question, uh, the name is uh, Hard Questions with Jeffrey. So obviously, we're not going to let him off easily, right? Um, but my first question uh, will be an easy one. So Jeffrey, what have you been up to lately? What brings you to Singapore? Yes. Um, hello, hello? Hello? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, I've been away for the last two years in, in China because lockdown. Actually, I just came back to Singapore like three weeks ago and the first thing I did uh, upon arrival is quickly get my first mRNA shot. Because <laughs> in China, I couldn't get my, my mRNA. So, and yesterday, two days ago, I just got my second shot. So it should be safe now. <laughs> um, yes, I've been flying around the world. Most of our business is outside of Singapore. We started in Singapore, but our revenue, our team is outside of Singapore. So now we have about 1,400 people globally. Wow. Uh, China, US, Europe is our main market. Yep. And next week I will be flying to Europe, US for another two months there. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I'm sorry, I made a mistake that I said you hired 700. No, you're 1,400 doubled since um, I get the last publication. So my next question, um, so basically, we want to go like um, topic, big topic by big topic. So the first one, I'm going to touch on more on the area of being the CEO and also managing your team. Uh, yeah, so I think the first one, which is most, uh, most interesting to me, is that some investors at the beginning actually mentioned that they don't feel you are cut out for the role of a CEO. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about that and how did you feel and so on? Yes. So. Um Actually, I think I really think entrepreneurship is a very intense journey for self-discovery. And I would say to really keep growing the business, the one thing must do is keep growing yourself, like myself. So I'm my character, I'm not sure if you all have done MBTI. My one is I'm introvert, ISTP. Like today, this type of session, really a lot of people for me, I will ex expend a lot of energy. After this type of event, I go back, need to watch Netflix, recharge a bit, like my own little corner. So, um, but yeah, when I first started, uh, my background is engineer, biomedical engineer, trained. And um, yeah, didn't know everything about business, didn't know how to pitch, didn't know how to communicate. So, um, um, we actually raised our seed funding in 2010. And uh, in 2014, we, are going, we go out to, went out to raise for Series A. So me and my angel investor back then in 2010, we went around the world. And back then, 2014, the VC environment wasn't definitely no way near where, where it is today. So there wasn't any uh, VC in town. So we actually went to both of us, like uh, try to on, on tight budget. We even I remember both of us sleeping on a share a Airbnb room back then. So we traveled to Germany, London, Silicon Valley, try to pitch, but obviously, investor overseas there, like why would they invest a startup that is 10,000 miles away? So I, th I think after one month plus back to Singapore, and then um, I couldn't remember the exact detail, but we were having a heated debate in his office, and then he bang on the table and say, Jeff, you are not fit to be CEO. Like, you know, when you pitch, you, 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 you are not confident. You cannot, you, how, how can investor invest in you like this? You need to command the room, you need to be more confident than any of them. But back then, I was really, um, really not sure. Like back then, I think our revenue about one million plus, but we have a um, big competitor, public listed company in US. We, I really don't know how we can beat them and win the market and many unknown. Yes, on, on my PPT, when we pitch, always have the nice revenue projection, but you know, all those are hunt one. Right? I mean, just put it there. <laughs> and um, and I, I, I didn't know whether I can achieve that or not. So actually when I, that's why it showed out from my, from my interaction that I, I didn't have enough that conviction and confidence. So that was um, kind of why he pointed that out. I was quite, I was quite, quite sad and disappointed as well because he's someone I respected. And uh, I remember I shed a few tears and then I went back and then, um, yeah. Um, there, there wasn't a moment where I kind of clicked and say, 
okay, this is how, how to lead a business, how to be CEO. I, I did question myself, I have self-doubt that whether am I suitable or not. It's, it's true, I mean, it's not confident, you don't know the direction, vision, always like, feel, feel a bit lost, confused, that kind of um, answer, that kind of feeling. So I think over the years, slowly, didn't have a moment, but over the years, slowly, I find that actually I have my own style of um, working with people, my own style of leadership. If actually I read literature, a lot of, I study a lot of other entrepreneurs as well. There are a lot of them actually uh, also introvert. I find that so it's quite comforting, okay, not just me introvert, actually a lot of other CEO is also introvert. Second thing is actually there is this, I read a HBR, leadership article called the, the authenticity leadership style or called the power of vulnerability. So actually sometimes being more direct, more real, actually that help gain trust with, with anyone, with my team member and also with my investor. When I look back, my career raising money from, from all these first tier investor, like I reckon like they definitely have seen thousands and thousands of, of entrepreneurs. Then why do they invest in PestNet, in, in me, in the team? I, I think actually it's my style maybe, of course you have to deliver, but I guess it's maybe also our style. Overall, me and my team, I guess we kind of cut from the same, same cloth. Like we are more a bit down to earth. We just say it is what it is. Um, if it doesn't work, we say like this one didn't work. But of course you tell them this is how we try to fix it and improve. Because really all investor, end of the day, they know every business shop a problem one. If you tell tell investor everything, no problem. I'm everything I know that, that I actually I even for me now when I do some personal angel investment like when I will I will tend to get attracted to someone who are just like try to know what he doesn't know. Yeah, if someone try to act like everything no, I just don't think is is uh, realistic. So I guess that is kind of um, my learning over over the years regarding this topic. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's not easy, especially when somebody whom you look up to don't give you that full of confidence, right? Um, and I must say that, uh, so for me, I do communications for Vertex, and I think that there are so many of our entrepreneurs who are very authentic, self-conscious, um, humble as well, and it's so amazing, it's very inspirational. Yeah, so with this, I want to ask you as well, has, has actually being an entrepreneur uh, a dream of yours? Um, no, actually, I, when I first started, I grew up in a very typical Asian middle class family. So since young, my parents, very typical uh, tiger mom, like very straight. Whenever you got good grades, good, good, good report card back home and tell, show them, they were like, have a nod. Mm, okay, that's all. <laughs> so actually, when I look back, one of my drive, but people have always asked me, hey, Jeff, why, 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 why keep going? Because like, a lot of time, those who may not know, I say, oh, I've been working on this 15 years. They were like, 15 years? Like, <laughs> so, so actually, uh, one drive actually come from, I, I think when I look back, in, when I first started, now I think getting less and less, it's actually about to prove myself. Yeah, to get, I think when, when I was young, didn't get enough acknowledgement, approval. So I think that converted to become my, my drive to, to keep, keep going. So, and, and up until I went to school here in, in, in US, so really my kind of feel profession in my head that my parents or the back then the culture instill is be a doctor, lawyer, and all, all, this, all this typical one. Never was entrepreneur on my list. And when I, and never was entrepreneur, I only have businessmen. And maybe since young, I watched those TV show, businessmen like, Go KTV, drink, <laughs> like, oh, under table money. I was like, I don't want to do that kind of thing. <laughs> so, but it, my whole perception changed during my uni time. Um, I went to this program called NUS Overseas College that sent entrepreneurial minded students to go US uh, and other places. And when I was in US, I learned that, like really soaking those Silicon Valley culture, like, oh, you can actually fresh grad, PhD from Garage build a product that many people can use that really inspiring. Yeah, I would say looking back, I'm really fortunate uh, and now I'm trying to do the same thing to my team, to my, to my kids as well. Really that exposure is so key. When, once you have that exposure, like my whole mind is like suddenly open up. 
like there is whole new world out there. And from since then in US, then that's why I start having this uh, thought of entrepreneurship. Great. Um, also something to admit, <clears throat> I'm also a proud alumni of the NUS Overseas College program as well. Yeah, and I, I see a, quite a few familiar faces in the crowd too. Yeah, I, and I think exposure is so important. And uh, also, I guess there are actually so few uh, role models in Southeast Asia. And I'm, I'm glad you know, you'll be able to tell us your story. And you never know, this could be inspiring new entrepreneurs as well. So since you mentioned about, you know, you have been doing this for 15 years, people were asking you, how do you get, uh, how do you keep going? So my next question is, what was the lowest point in your entrepreneurship journey? And what is it that keeps you going? Yes, many, many, many low points. And every low point is, um, when I look back, is more low than the previous low point and more expensive, cost more. So in 2000, and we raised our first seed funding, $1 million. I, back then, you know, still today, a lot of money. And very quickly, I ramped up from 10 plus people to 40, 50 people. But I didn't know what I was doing, then have to lay off half the company. And in half a year time, I spent, I think, half a million dollars. So back then, I, I told, told my, my, my team, say, this is my MBA lesson, half a million dollars. Like, more, much more expensive, but down the road, we I even have a $10 million mistake, even more painful. I think all this, usually the low period, when I look back, uh, all related to, to people, at least for, for my case. Because like this uh, 2010 and even down the road, the most recent one, I think, more kind of low point for my career is 2019. So in 2019, um, so 2016, we raised our Series C uh, from Sequoia about 40 plus million dollars. So also taught a lot of money and then we grow, grow, grow. So I remember from 200, grow to 400 in one year and then uh, double again to 800 the next year. But really growing that fast and for me who really not exactly know what, what I was doing. So actually a lot of issue came out and all kind of accumulate and all explode on 2019. And um, things like, because we're growing so fast, we didn't hire the right people, the right culture, right value fit and from top to, to bottom. So, and the top level part, also there was around 17, 18, after we raised the Series C, I told my team, I say, hey guys, like a few of us, all oh, fresh grad, what, what do we know? Let's hire the pro come in now. Let's pay and get the pro professional manager come in. So we hired the general manager of uh, Microsoft China, and then didn't work out, we hired the GM of Dell China, because we don't know, we never, run a few hundred salesperson team before. So we hope that, hey, this guy, very senior, 50 plus years old, should know what they do. But it's a, that time was a big, big, big mistake. Yeah, all these people who came in really, really disrupt the whole culture. So this guy who, one of the GM, like he, he's a smart guy from Tsinghua and he was in Oracle, SAP, Dell, all this. And then, uh, but every time they come in, keep scolding people, everyone scold. Like me also scold. Like back then I was really afraid of him, to be frank. And really, I, I don't know, like, is it, is, is it supposed to be like this one, man, as salesperson, you need to be very alpha, keep scolding people. Now, I, I didn't know, and I was afraid. I don't feel right, but then, you know, I don't know what is right back then. Back, back then. And then also have fear. I think a lot of things, when I look back, I think entrepreneurship is also a journey of facing your own fear. I, I, I have fear. Like my fear is, what if he leave, then who take care of the sales? Then we have no sales number, then we are shit. So like, don't, don't dare to do too much or like, just, just, just let him be like kind of ostrich putting my head into sand, like as long as, you know, um, delivering, then should be fine. But of course, of course, uh, it's not the case. So um, um, yeah, he, he, he really did very, quite disruptive to the culture. And everyone, cause we were quite flat, everyone open, discussed. And after him coming in, the whole company was just, everyone is so afraid to, to speak, to speak up. And um, in the first few quarters, seems like the number going up, but actually looking back a lot, the, yes, there was some growth, but a, other part of it is also actually just playing with the numbers. Like now, I, now I know there are many tricks. You can play the number, the contract, put a bit here and there, then it looks like you are growing, like all these things. So, um, so in the end, I have to let him go. And, uh, and that day when I, I remember let him go, I even 
get security guard there. I, I don't know what he will do, like kick table or what. So I was really scared. So, but in the end, so I kind of, um, kind of took over the sales and, and really, really face it and really learn, like really learn how to work with sales team, manage sales team, and then um, go, go from there. So I think things like this that when I look back, really it's all about my, if you say lack of experience or back then, uh, incompetency of dealing with people seems different sort of people seems more senior like didn't know how to handle them and that and didn't find and therefore didn't find the right type of people and therefore the whole company culture went back and all this you know starting 19 20 20 you have social media so on the west we have you no know, glass store so a lot of employees go shoot at the glass store you know it's quite painful back then like oh the CEO or she didn't know stuff on glass store and now, now I don't really fucking care anymore. Yeah, but um, because you, you can't make everyone happy. Yeah, uh, and then in China, got China version, so it was quite tough. Publicly within the company, everyone, all the arrows shooting at me, so that was quite uh, tough time. And because of that, that year, both sides, our London office and China office, both had issue. That year was the most hell to me. Like one week China, fly back weekend Singapore, one week London, like back and forth, back and forth for the whole year. So that was one of the most challenging time for me, at least the most recent one. So what keeps you going despite the tough times? Yes. Um, yes, that's why a lot of people ask me that. I think I was, um, yeah, I was just talking to my therapist uh, yesterday like uh, about this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so because of all this 2019, 2020, really tough. So actually my mood was very low. And then just, just very low. Don't just feel very like, ah, every day like a lot of issue then i got a good friend share hey maybe you should see therapist so back then like i was like why why see therapist only if you cuckoo you go see therapist a wrong very wrong perception about mental health so i i did when go go to see so i was diagnosed like depression mild depression then now i learned more depression is like having a, a flu i mean everyone at this different stage of life you will have it just know how to deal with it so i start talking to a therapist uh last two years like one, one two way every um, and I was just talking to her yesterday about this I think um, um, my drive like even though all this tough time I seriously never consider like quit or give up that option never on my mind just somehow I was curious like people always ask like but to me I never had that option of quit to me just just go ahead but it's just very tough I'm not sure but I will still go ahead so, and why that when I peel off the onion, uh, many layer, I, I think many, many dimension to it. One dimension is, I think that's why it's important to grow a business. Actually, I, 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 I'm a big believer or even in life in general, you really need to know yourself, know yourself as much as you can. What is your fear? What is your strength? Like certain things, like when I look back uh, now, I, I feel like I have, have, you know, getting older and older. In the past, when I was younger, very gung ho, everything want to do the best, like want to do maximize every minute, every hour, all the meeting, very packed, back to back. But now sometimes like you kind of learn to prioritize certain things and just like fine, that is you know, not my thing. And everything try to be the best. But now I'm like, now I kind of, I think it should be a better way that certain thing I know I'm not good at, don't, 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 don't just don't try to act, you are good at it, then just say I'm, I'm shit. Then, find someone compliment me and say, that one, you go cover for me. Yeah. So work as a team to compliment each other. Many things like that, that I learned um, over the years. But one thing is, so my character is, as I mentioned, ISTP, actually the other phrase for that is uh, more explorer. So I like to explore. So for me, as long as I keep growing and see something different, like to me, that is one of my motivation, like explore curiosity. The other one, uh, also back to just now, like my, my, when I was young, didn't get enough acknowledgement, approval. I think that feel that, that no matter what, until today, I don't think I need to prove to anyone, but still that I know that is inside me. I want to do something better, like keep pushing the envelope. Um, things like that, a, a few uh, uh, reasons that keep me going. Thank you for sharing all this. Um, yeah, I just want to you know, reiterate some of what you said. You know, one is, Knowing yourself, I think that is so super important. And then secondly, hiring people who will be a fit with your company and your culture. 
not, not make an assumption just because someone has great achievements, that means they will be able to do the same, um, do as well in another, in another business. Yeah, and then being kind to yourself, um, seeking therapy, um, and not seeing that as a bad thing, because the thing is, being a good entrepreneur, being able to build a business sustainably, it's about you know being in your top form, right? Your physical, mental well-being, your emotional uh, well-being as well. Yeah, so I think these are some of the, some of the great things that you have shared with us. Um, so I'm going to you know jump to the next part. So there will be uh, two more parts. So one is on raising investments specifically, and then lastly will be personal. Yeah, so whenever uh, I see that we have time, then I'll jump back to some of the uh, questions that we had uh, from the floor. Okay, so um, yeah, so just, just a curious question. Uh, when Vertex invests in PetSnap, how did you get connected with Vertex in the first place? How did you get to know us? Yeah. yeah, yeah, looking back, one thing about at least looking at myself and those other entrepreneurs I know, I think yes, we all work hard diligent, you know, persistent, but uh, really at many point of my entrepreneurship journey, there are a lot of serendipity and, and luck. I think somehow at the right time, right place, you meet the right person. So for, for Vertex Series A, I think um, our angel investor know Carmen from Vertex, they were ex-colleague, so then they connect and then somehow like this. And our Series B, I can share also our Series B, we raised $10 million from a proper uh, in, in Silicon Valley like a uh, fund there called Summit Partners. So after we raised Series A from Vertex, then we were thinking like with a few million dollars, now let's um, go to US market. Let's set up in SF, go to SF. So we went to SF back then was 2015 and then go around. So we got a, a office, a real estate agent lady help us to look for offices there in SF. And, um, and, and, then, and then we talked and then she, she introduced her boyfriend who is working in this firm, Summit Partner, and he is an associate there. And then we link up and we talk, and somehow we got $10 million from them. <laughs> yeah. We didn't actively go, we, we did, really didn't actively go look for investment. Somehow one leads to another. So, um, yeah, I, I think all this, like Series C from Sequoia, China, is because I think Keylock or Juhok know, know uh, a Sequoia partner who was from Singapore as well, then make an introduction, and then we talk. Then, then also just like this. Of course, I mean these are the the main story. Beside the behind the scene, I got rejected many times as well. I preach on my own, so yeah. Yeah, we want to actually ask the question. You know, you told me that you have been rejected by at least hundred investors. Yeah, yeah. yeah just so few days ago, I got rejected by another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you know, tell us. You know, what 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 did how did you feel, and what are some of the advice that you could give on uh, raising money? Um, <laughs> I think um, a, a few few anger to that. There was um, I, I think I think sometimes there's really so many investors. I met so many investors across China, US, here uh, mainly. Yeah, these three continent. I think um, yes, you have to convince your investor, but sometimes really not everyone. Uh, most of the time, actually, not everyone know your business as you do. So sometimes people reject. I, I think it's, it's fine. I, I uh, of course feel bad. Like a few days ago, we spoke to one. Um, like you still feel a bit down, but to me, it's like I move on and get the feedback and then say I agree. Certain feedback, yes, we need to work on. Certain that okay, yeah, is uh, I don't really agree, but just keep building the business. I think um, is 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 okay to get feedback from them, but actually I don't think should take it too personally on the rejection. It, I mean, saying is this, but yes, when you get rejected, you still feel a little bit bad. Like a few days ago, I feel like, like half an hour, then I, then I continue already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, just like you mentioned about uh, cultural fit for employees, yeah. and do you believe in the investor, you know, investor company fit? Yes, I, I actually strongly like, think it's super important. Investor also make or break your investment. I think we are very fortunate, PestNet, very fortunate so far from, from, from C, Series A, B, C, D, E. I think all the investors we met is really understanding and really 
Like, of course, they are also um, very smart first tier investor. So um, I think finding good investor is, is really key uh, because uh, if you don't have the right investor and come in, then it won't make it um, harder for you. So finding, I think finding investor, and I keep telling my team as well, hiring a, high, a new hire is so key. When you find the right person, it's already 50% of the better one. If you didn't hire the right person, no matter what you did after that, a lot of one-on-one, one-on-one, one-on-one is, is still hard. Finding the right person is so key. And we are lucky all these investors have been very supportive to us. Yeah, like Vertex has been quite supportive for entrepreneurs. Um, so I think we are lucky in that sense. Yeah, and I'm actually going to ask you more about this. You know, I hear that uh, your, your investors have helped you to open doors to the new round of investors. Yeah, what, what else you know, can you actually get from investors? So you know, it maybe really it's a good, good um, yeah, to share with the entrepreneurs so they know what else, how can they work with investors? Yeah. yeah. So yes, a lot of you know, literature out there say, oh, get, get smart money, not dumb money. So that is very textbook ideal. To be frank, um, really to be frank, like for us, we, get, we got Sequoia, Tencent, SoftBank, like we are just one out of their few hundred or thousand portfolio. And all these investors have their own KPI. Once they invest in you, they need to go quickly find other companies to deploy their capital. They really not much, to be frank, at least to us, not much time to you know, come in. Oh, you need any help? They just, they just move on. Yes, they will say like a lot of other investors say, oh yeah, we have a recruitment team in-house. We can help you recruit open door. Like all these are, uh, most of the time are BS. Like you are, you are on your own. You are still on your own. It's true. I mean, uh, but they, okay, I want to you know, rephrase. When we need help, we go to them say, hey, I want to meet this person. I need this, this. They will still come, but but I, don't, I think don't expect them to help too much. Those help, I see that as a bonus. End of the day, we are, I mean, to me, entrepreneurs are on your own. And this same applies to Singapore government. A lot of time when I meet other entrepreneurs or Singapore government officials, always say, oh, what else can we do? Seriously, I've been to so many countries, I really think Singapore government has done a lot, a lot. Really, now it's up to the entrepreneur, go and hustle and just, just hustle. Yeah, yeah. Um, can I just differentiate, I guess, what you mentioned is more like Series C and above investors are likely to be more transactional, I guess. Yeah. And I hope, I mean, hopefully, uh, Vertex has done more than just <laughs> what you mentioned. Yeah. Um, so, so I just want to, yeah, I, I think you have mentioned a lot about raising investment. Um, you have mentioned about how it was, um, sometimes the door opens at the right time. Uh, that's great for you. But uh, is there any advice, you know, in terms of, uh, for, for entrepreneurs, for not running out of money, right? Is there like, yeah? Um, yeah, it's tough. I mean, there are definitely many sleepless nights, uh, very intense. I think entrepreneurship is very intense, especially if you are founder, CEO. My analogy is always as a founder, CEO, you are on a tall, tall mountain alone and got cold wind blowing at you and you still have to make decision end of the day. Like, Really, you can talk to your co-founder, your everyone, mentor, family, end of the day, you have to make that decision and have to be responsible for that decision. No one to blame. Um, it's tough. I actually kind of get a hang of this responsibility and comfortable with making this type of, like there's no right answer type of decision, only like also, also the last couple of years. Initially, really, I think don't have enough that conviction because you never know. This person tell you A, this person tell you B, like, don't know, yeah. So, um, I, I think, um, I, I, I learned that is, is true that, and now actually in my, a lot of my friends in, in the Bay Area and others, like start, they do a lot of what you call, whatever, like assessing your, your higher energy level, like meditation, all these things, I think to a certain extent it helps. Like really, listening to your own gut voice, gut feeling. Like, yes, I, I still talk to everyone and end of the day, I will process it myself. I will do a jogging, have a shower, do other things, and then I like, kind of mouth over it. And then, then I say, yes, this is the decision I want. And, and have, have more that firm and conviction. Yes, there are times that that is a wrong decision, um, but 
there is a saying that indecision is also a type of decision. So I would rather wrong, but wrong fast, and then correct it and go. And this is this applied to my team as well. A lot of time our team, like everyone argue, 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 like there is no right answer. I say, let's just decide on ABC. Quickly go. And the most important thing is the whole team is aligned. Go, if it's wrong, then we correct. Like what Jeff Bezos said, a lot of decisions are two-way door. Most of the decisions are two-way door, not one-way door, most of it. So it's okay. Then when you really not sure, not sure, still make that decision and then, then go and see how it goes. So um, that is how, how I operate. Yeah, and I guess some decisions allow you to do a pilot, right? You don't have to make the decision full-blown. You can test it yeah, and, and, and get feedback. I think that's the most important thing. Um, so I think we have covered quite a bit. So I want to go into the personal part, mm. right? Um, so I want to ask you what was... Okay, so you mentioned in the beginning you were not uh, looking to be an entrepreneur to begin with, right? So, so what else did you sacrifice along this journey? Besides, you know, maybe um, the hopes that your parents have. Yeah, what, what else did you sacrifice? Mm. <laughs> Until now, my parents still doesn't know what I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> they still don't know what I do. They just think uh, it seems too well, yeah, but they don't know what I do. Uh, I would say definitely one thing, because especially the last few years, COVID, um, all these things, I'm, I'm kind of stuck in China, because every time back and forth, back then, 14 plus 7 was really tough. So I think one thing definitely miss out a lot is uh, my time with my family, with my kids. That is definitely one thing miss out. Other than that, actually I'm, yeah, I think it's, it's okay. Like if I look back at my last 15 years of journey, it's, it's definitely tough and I will not want to go through it one more time again, but I will not trade it for other things as well. Like I think it's cool. Like I, I think it's, it's cool, but I definitely will not want to go through it one more time again. How many kids do you have? I have three kids, two, wow. four, six, all girls, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, I'm just going to ask you a cheeky question. How much, did you, how much salary did you draw? <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, uh, in the early days, the first one, two years, I pay myself 600 bucks a month. It's wow. very, very little. Wow. little. Even, even, even up until Series A, I think maybe a few thousand dollars. I think we really start raising our price, uh, our own, <laughs> own, own uh, pay. I think after 16 years, 16 years, then I uh, uh, tried to ask for like 300k for myself. So since then, then have been kept the same, never changed for the last few years. I don't have bonus, everything, just flat 300k. Yeah. Any annual, right? Huh? <laughs> 300k annual. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> anyway, of course. Of course, of course yeah, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, I, you know, as you were describing your journey, you are describing your salary and you mentioned about your three kids. Um, could you tell us a bit about your partner? <laughs> and how, yeah, he must be a very supportive person and, and also any advice in terms of finding the right partner for an entrepreneur? You mean in business, like co-founder, partner? Uh, no, as in your, uh, <laughs> uh, your, your uh, family, your yeah, partner. Family, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I'm really grateful. I think my... My wife has been very supportive, understanding, even though I've been flying around, very patient with the kids. Like, yeah, I, I think that I can only say also very fortunate. Yeah, I know my wife in a uh, uh, fresh grad in NUS, and since then I've been 20 years yeah, together. That's, that's great. Um, there are actually quite a few questions from the audience. So one, maybe one immediate question I ask you is, so, so moving away from the personal question, so going back to general ones, um, any plans to IPO in the future? Um, yes, I got asked this question every time internally when I have town hall as well. All the, uh, some of them will share us uh, whether IPO or not. I, um, I, I actually think internally, I, I, I kind of tell prep the team that IPO is just another funding event and um, nothing special about it. In fact, it will be more stressful when you have an IPO, you have more public uh, shareholder. Imagine after quarter didn't do well and then the employees, parents come like, how come your company didn't do well? I bought the stock, the stock went down. Like, <laughs> if I can imagine it will be more stressful to run a public company. Of course, eventually, I think we will, we, we will get there and should get there. 
I think the timeline looking at where we are today, our performance, I think about a few years time, three to four years time, I think we should reach that uh, performance that I think the public market and by then of the window for IPO should be better as well. Yeah. Got it. And uh, someone was asking some of your notable investors uh, are under pressure to do some divestment. So how has this uh, affected PaxNet? Divestment. Yeah. So I mean, some of the okay, I, I should not name the investors, but then some of them were under pressure to to maybe did did any investors maybe rush you to go for IPO? Yeah. So how, do you, how do you fend them back? How do you, yeah. So far, every time it's Vertex, ask me, wait, when IPO? <laughs> <laughs> Keylock and Joe always say, hey, IPO, IPO. I say, no, no, a few more years. <laughs> but I, but I, I would say also very lucky, the fundraising event, the last few rounds, how we paced. Um, so by now, actually, all our early, early stage investor, A, B, yeah, C round, um, they didn't want to sell, but A, B, and all the pre-seed investor all already uh, make back their money. Um, still, still, still have substantial share in PestNet. So I think the the pressure to divest exceed not so much for us. And the later stage costs just came in. So I think still okay. And our and also one of the reasons why we took money from guys like SoftBank and Tencent. I mean they have a lot of cash. So yeah. Thank you. I'm going to just uh, give you the last question and then we're opening up the floor because I'm sure some of you have burning question now. So the last question is. What does success mean for you and what does failure mean for you? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is one thing also, I don't know, since um, maybe PestNet got term you know, unicorn, then kind of people think, oh, oh, Jeff, you are successful. To me, to me, really, I don't see a success because really literally the day before and after we kind of publicly announced we are this status, Nothing changed within the company. I still have a lot of shit to solve every day. Still the same, and um, to me, yeah, not, nothing changed. Still, still a lot to to work on. Um, um, if you ask me, success will be if I can keep growing, if I can have um, you know, he healthy, okay, like really. I mean, now I'm at this age. Recently, I start looking into actually another whole field. Uh, anti-aging, like all this, <laughs> I know, as long as I'm healthy, I can do the things I like, keep growing, venture out, explore new things. To me, that is cool. That is already success. Failure is, is um, I didn't push myself enough to grow myself enough. Yeah. Thank you. So now I would like to open the, up the floor. So anyone have questions can just put out your hand so we can, we can ask Jeffrey directly. Okay. Okay. Hi Jeffrey, thank you for the sharing. It's really, really encouraging. Um, so um, could you share with us a little more about when you first started? I read like in 2007 and it took you a while to two years or a few years to, 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 to even develop the product. Could you share a bit more? And also, did you get revenue or were you very sure about this is the right business? Could you share about that part of the journey? Yeah, yeah, wasn't sure at all. Even until 2014, seven years, six, seven years of that, I still not sure. Still not, don't have that conviction. Uh, okay, so 2007, I started in the backyard of NUS in the incubator. So they gave us a space. I, I started with $55,000. So back then, there's an agency, MDF. Now I think much with IMDF. So NUS gave us the, really my, my seed capital, $55,000. So that's how we started. And then they gave us a space. And then, uh, but $55,000 back then didn't, wasn't enough to develop the product. It cost like back then million, a million plus to develop everything. So after a year, 2008, um, and then at the site, we do some side project, make some money and get, keep getting other grant, whatever grant we can get on, tap our cell phone. Cause I was uh, uh, Malaysian. So I went to Malaysia, get some money back and, and everything just try to get, get whatever money we can get. And then in 2008, uh, 2008, I think the bank left maybe 100, 200K sing dollar. And I was thinking like, yeah, if we continue to stay in Singapore, I think the we'll, company will die. De definitely not enough money to make it. So back then, make a, until now, still a very inflection point, critical decision. So me and my another business partner back then, we decided to went to China. 
So that was the first step I stepped foot into China. It was mind blowing because I, I've been to US, I thought like, you know, US is big enough. Then when I first went to China, totally blow my mind. It's just very, you know, very naive and, um, yeah, and entrepreneur thought like so many people, I went there, so many people, everyone just make one bucks, like you got a billion dollar market there. And that was Beijing Olympic, that was October 2008. So very, very vibrant, so buzzing, like all the cities we went to. So we went to a few cities, uh, and then in the end, we, we settled down in Suzhou, about half an hour bullet train from Shanghai. And the reason also just because um, I got a high school friend also doing startup there. So I just tumpang his company, and then just like this, we somehow now our most of our people are also in Suzhou. So that is how we started in 2009, using the remaining money, we hired the developer there. And back then, the cost advantage, one reason also going China is the cost. So back then, one person here, we can hire five person in China. Back then, now, now even our Chinese are getting more expensive than here. So, uh, so with that, 2009, one year, we developed the product. End of 2009, early 2000, came back, and then hustle again, knock on the door, sold to a few institutes and then we got a few customers, and then we pitched to an angel investor. Somehow we got our first million dollar. Thank you, Jeffrey, and thank you for the question. Anyone else would like to ask a question? Hi, Jeffrey. Um, that was very interesting. Thank you. So you talked a little bit about trusting your gut instinct, and you also talked about the importance of finding a good investor. So do you think you would sacrifice funding if you didn't feel the investor was right for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I don't have a straight answer for that because it really depends on the context, on the context of that. But I would say in general, if the investor is really not, because there are a fine line between a bad actor and someone just being tough and very just want to maximize the negotiation uh, power. So, uh, but someone, I would say if someone really tough, or really kind of to me, bad actor is like, give you $1 million, I ask for 90% of a share. That definitely no, no go, yeah. That, that is not, not right at all. So um, I would say my experience so far, in general, not just with investor, working with people who don't have the right value. Of course, the right value, the spectrum is high, uh, is broad. They are, from one end, it's really like bad, bad, no integrity. That one really, definitely no. To another end, like, yes, a bit okay, but not exactly good fit. I think we will pass. Because so far, my experience and um, working with people who are not exactly right value, end of the day, no matter what scheme you come out, what structure you try to protect, end of the day, it just doesn't work. Just doesn't work. And recently, I think a few days ago, I saw a quote from, uh, um, who, um, the uh, Warren Buffett partner, how was his name again? Um, huh? uh, Charlie Munger, correct, correct. He mentioned the same, exact same phrase. Like, don't try, to, don't try to work with the wrong guy, I think. But of course, if someone that is tough on you, like he may not be the bad guy tough on you, I think this really, you have to figure out. Like, over the years, I would say, I'm, I think fortunate in that sense, my partner, um, uh, and also investors seems tough. Back then also had a lot of fight, disagreement. Um, <laughs> I always like to use the example. So my, my co-founder is there, Marcus, is uh, a German. So when I first, you know, we worked together for 12 years. Like German really, when I first worked with him, is so no BS, inflexible, like this, this is it. Like cause in startup, like you sometimes customers say, if you do this, they will buy. I say, come on, can you just help me do it? no. This is my plan, already fixed, done, this is it. <laughs> so it's so inflexible, I was so pissed off back then. But one thing about this, this German guy is when he say he will deliver, he will deliver, the quality is good. So I just learned to, de learn to work with the very different persona. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to have the last question. So I'll pass the mic to Hi, I'm Jeffrey. Uh, thanks for sharing on uh, so much. I mean, I'm a former entrepreneur in China. Maybe I'll connect with you later to share some war stories. Um, my question is, why is Pestnet looking into the Web3 world? And, you know, is, is there any application in your, uh, in your business context uh, as you see it in the future? Thanks. Currently, short answer is uh, not exactly. I mean, uh, long slide, longer answer is all these ideas I have been pondering and observing, but all these are currently all in my head. I haven't 
sometimes really actually founder type we have many ideas I, I learn to control it a bit all my guys know my, my team know I have a lot of ideas in fact they say jokingly say when Jeff tell you something wait for him to tell you three times only you act on it <laughs> like, I got many things like <laughs> good idea come and go but for this web trees I find it very interesting using blockchain I think IP and blockchain there are certain relevancy there um, so but now currently it's just all ideas at the back of my head Okay, um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to all of you, you know, for your kind attention and also your great questions. And I want to, of course, thank Jeffrey. You can see that he's really humble and really nice. And so thank you so much for being vulnerable, answering all our questions, whether it's hard or not. Yeah, thank you so much for coming okay. here. Thank you, Vertex. Thank you, Vertex, for paying for everyone's food and drink here. <laughs>